Hello and welcome to module eight of the introduction to network, the network layer. So let's um, remember, I'm going to ask you to take a few questions. Hello. Okay, here we go. So what is the network layer is responsible for? The network layer is the one that grabs the segment from the transport layer and encapsulates it into a packet. So here's what I want you to write down. The four basic operations that the network layer does. It does the addressing after it grabs the segment and encapsulates it in a packet. It puts the source and the destination IP addresses on it. It encapsulates, that's what I just said, encapsulates layer four segment into a packet. Routing, after it finishes the packet, is trying to find the best route outside in a, la in a WAN to the destination. And decapsulation, of course being able to grab the frame and pull the packet out. All right, so encapsulation, like I said, you take the data from layer seven, when you add a header to it, a segment, a layer four segment header, it becomes this whole thing is called a segment. That's what transport layer protocol data units is called. All of the segment is placed in here. And when you add a, an IP headers to it, it becomes, this whole thing becomes a packet okay all right so here are the three characteristics of ip the internet protocol which operates at layer three write these down and we're going to write a definition for each one of them connectionless best effort and media independent so let's start with connectionless connectionless means when i send you out data um I don't have to see if you are connected or not, if you're not up. All right, so I'll just send out the data. If you're not up, too bad, your letter is not gonna get there, right? So that's what connectionless is. Connection-oriented means, on the other hand, if it was connection-oriented, but it's not, is uh, before I go out to send you the data, I would have to call you to see if you're there. If you're there, then I go. If not, I don't even transmit the data. So connection oriented means you got to make a connection first before you send any data out. Connection less means you don't check to see if he's connected or not. You just go, you just transmit the data. And that's what packets are doing. You don't even know if the IP address exists or not. You just send the data, the packet out. Best that, remember you're writing that definition as connection less means you don't make a connection. You don't make a connection with the destination before you send out any data. Best effort is mean you're trying to find the best route to the destination, right? Uh, the, nothing is guaranteed. So links may be down, but uh, you try to find the best pack, uh, the best path to the destination. Media independent also. It doesn't matter if you have a coaxial cable, an, op, an optical fiber cable or a copper cable, wireless, IP packet can travel on any media. Why? Because the packet does not really travel on any of these media. They really are framed. So in here, if you are inside a LAN, you're all, the packet is traveling inside um, an Ethernet frame. If you are on a copper wire, maybe you're on a dedicated LAN, you could be traveling on a PPP frame. If you are on an optical, maybe an FDDI frame. You could be wireless, for example, on an 802.11 frame. Right, so they are media independent because they are really encapsulated in the frame. The frames are media independent, but the packet inside it, you know, he doesn't care where the what the media is because the frame is the one that's carrying the packet from one device to the other. All right, so um, what is? Let, let's take a look at the packet header itself. Here is the IPv4 header, and there's a lot of labels on it. Version, this is, should tell us this is a version four. Here's where the IP addresses are located. Uh, the time to live, TTL number, very important number. This is every hop that you go through, this number is decremented by one. So if it reaches zero and you did not reach the destination, if the TTL number reaches zero and you did not reach the destination, then your packet is dropped. Did you ever ping, you type ping an IP address and you get a timeout? 
most likely is because the destination doesn't exist and the TTL number has reached zero uh, before your packet reached the destination. Um, there's a whole bunch of other. Uh, there is the total length, uh, the header checksum, and so on. The protocol, it's an IP packet, for example. So here's what I want you to write also. This is what the header fields are, the labels. So please write these down. I know it's a little bit of a pain, but at least you'll do it once. We're not going to do this again. Anyway, so let's take a look at IPv6 packet. Pretty much the same thing, not much. IPv6 is uh, the major limitation is we have basically run out of IP addresses. You know, you know, 32 bits is not good enough. So now we have 128 bits. 2 to the 128 is an extremely um, long number. We don't have to worry about this. And the biggest change is that we don't need NET anymore, the network address translation to get a public IP address to get on the Internet. Everyone that is assigned um, an IPv6 address will be able to access the Internet without having to be translated from private to public and so on. So you go right through your from your private LAN to your destiny, to your Internet without having to use the use of net, which is great for real-time communication, such as uh, voice over IP or, um, or video streaming. All right, so just imagine here is 1 billion addresses we have. Uh, a use of decillion is 10 to the 36. So there are that many addresses for IPv6. So that's a lot. That's a lot of addresses, right? We never have to worry about that. So improvement to IPv6, please write these three points down. Well, you know, 10 to the 28, 128 bits. Improved packet handling, less fields on the packet, and no need for NAT, right? Less labels, which is really nice, right? We just talked about that. Even though the address is bigger, but there's less labels for the router to look at. So the packet will move much quicker. That's the whole idea. All right, so please write this down. Also, these are some of the labels that are seen or are placed on the IPv6 packet. All right. Um, what else do you need to know? Okay, routing. <clears throat> Another important, you know, the router. Uh, I'm sorry. The network layer, third responsibility, is finding the best path to the destination. What does that mean, the best path? The best path means the quickest, really. Now, there are three different ways you can either communicate to yourself. That means you're sending data using a loopback address, 127.0. If, so if you ping 127.0.0.1 or ping colon colon 1 for IPv6, what you're really doing, you're trying... We're checking the local host for connectivity if he is able to encapsulate and decapsulate packets locally without having to communicate with anyone you can communicate with local hosts send data locally inside your LAN or you can communicate remotely going through your router outside all right so um <clears throat> we can you know IPv4 uses the IP address, the mask, we'll discuss more of that later on when we get into subnetting in the next few chapters. Uh, let's just move on. We'll get to that later on. But let's let's talk about the default gateway, okay? So all the lands, in all the hosts in the LAN must know who the gateway is, which is this right here. So when you send out an AIP request requesting the MAC address of somebody in your LAN, that somebody in the LAN will respond back to you. But what happens if you're saying, hey, if you're requesting an IP address because you're at, you, got, you got the IP address somebody remotely from outside and you have that IP address and said, hey, whoever has this IP address, give me your Mac. You're doing an ARP request and nobody responds. So if nobody responds, listen to this, this is where by default you ask for the IP address of your gateway default gateway in other words if no if you if the destination is not in your land 
by default, you go to your gateway so you can be sent outside. If you do not have the IP address of your gateway, you will not be able to communicate with the outside world, but you'll still be able to communicate internally. So one of the first things you want to do if you don't have connection to the outside world is, first of all, ping your loopback address, E127001 for IPv4, or ping call in call in one if it's IPv6. Then you ping your default gateway. If, you're, if your default gateway responds, that means you're connected to your router. The problem is probably outside. All right, so PCs can have their own routing table. So by typing the command, I'm sorry, by typing the command netstat-r, it tells you all the local links that you can communicate with. But typically the routing table, the routing happens on the routers. So when you send the packet to the router, what does the router do? Looks up the destination IP address, the stamp. Well, the first thing that the router does is it grabs the ethernet frame, pulls the packet out, looks at the destination IP address that's stamped on the packet, looks up a chart called the routing table and try to find where to send it to. So he says, oh, that IP address is, we have to send it this way. So he gives it to this interface. This interface will re-encapsulate the packet in a new frame and sends it to this router. And this router will do the same thing. Pull the packet out of that frame, looks at the destination IP address, looks up a chart called the routing table, and according to the chart, either send them out to the internet or send them out this way, depending on what the routing table tells them to. These are called routes in the routing table. So these routes in the routing table either can be, you know, statically typed in manually or dynamically, you know, the routers talk to each other. So please write down the three types of routes that are found in the routing table. Either they're directly connected, which means nobody has to type them in because, you know, you're directly connected to the router or manually an administrator typed them in or dynamically they're learned by from neighboring router they're, this router too told them that this network 1012 is located is connected to me so he tells r1 that so r1 will immediately place that in a router the administrator doesn't have to do anything because you're running a routing protocol called either rip ospf or eigrp we'll talk about that uh, sometimes in the future, sometime in the future, the default route means so I don't even even you know default route means this is will be forwarded to a specific interface no matter what. So I you know uh, <clears throat> every packet that comes in will go out of this interface for example. All right, if I look up the whole routing table and there's no match by D, I'll go to the default route. So if I look at your packet and I don't have, I don't know where to send you to, you know, by default, I'm going to send you out of this interface or this interface or whatever. That's what that default route means. All right. So again, static routing is the administrator types it in. Configure, can you manually configure that? Dynamic routing is when the routers talk to each other to build the routing table. And all right. So here's the routing tables. When you see the letter C means you're directly connected. The letter O means I learned it dynamically using OSPF protocol. Letter D, if you see the letter D in the routing table on the router, that means you learned it from EIGRP. If you see the letter R, it means you learned it dynamically using the routing protocol um, RIP. C, that means you're directly connected. Those are the directly connected interfaces. And the default route usually will have the letter S next to them, static with a star. All right, that's it for chapter eight. So please write down whatever I asked you to and submit them as homework, and I'll see you in the next chapter.